So to summarise today, um, we see International Women's Day, the Southern Melbourne Integrated Family Violence Network chose the theme, Make It Happen, Equality for All Women. International Women's Day has been celebrated all over the world since the early 1900s and it's a day where we recognise social, economic, cultural and political achievements of women. It's a day also to reflect gender equality in Australia and how we continue to improve this. Here's some uh, facts that you guys might not be aware of and before I actually uh, go through those facts, I'd like to read you a little quote by a famous uh, poet, Charlotte Winton. Uh, her quote is, whatever women do, they must do twice as well as men to be thought half as good. So something to think about. Um, now here's some, here's some fun facts for you all to understand. Currently, and I'm talking about 2016 right now, the pay gap between Australian men, men and women is at its widest, at 19%. The difference in this pay gap Im it impacts women's ability to obtain a home, home loan or save for a deposit or make an investment. One woman a week is killed by her partner or someone known to her in a domestic violence situation. Domestic violence is a main cause of homelessness in Australia for women and children, and diversity uh, in the workplace is not currently representative of our communities. Women retire one third, with one third less superannuation than their male counterparts, and women are still highly sexualised in advertising. March the 8th today provides a global opportunity for everybody, both men and women, to show their support and work together towards gender equality. I want you to ask yourself today, what conversations will you start? Who will you influence? What changes will you make to your organisations and social groups and wider community? What decisions can you make this year that will have a lasting impact on the future generations and open doors for more opportunities for women? Let's make this year happen. I'd now like to introduce our first speaker. She's the CEO of Domestic Violence Victoria, the peak body for family violence services for women and children. Her organisation provides political advocacy on behalf of and in partnership with its members, organisations for violence prevention, systemic change, enhancements of systems. She represents the family violence sector on statewide and ministerial committees. Highlights of her work have included presenting at Shenyang as part of the China-Australia Human Rights Technical Coordination Program and to the UN Commission on the Status of uh, Women. Please wait, make welcome Miss Fiona McCormick. Cheers, Joey. Thanks so much to the organisers for um, allowing me to come and speak to you on this really, really critical day about such an important issue. So I'd also like to pay my respects to um, the traditional carers of this land, the Wurundjeri people, uh, to their elders, past and present, and any other elders here today. So we work for the peak body for family violence services. And you might wonder, what has gender equality got to do with uh, family violence? Well, in a nutshell, actually a lot. So we're in the business, we and our family violence service uh, member organisations are in the business of trying to turn rates of violence against women around. And rates of violence against women in our community are horrific. You'd probably be aware there were 79 uh, women, Australian women, murdered through violent circumstances just last year alone. Uh, there's um, one in three women will experience uh, violence from uh, an intimate partner during her lifetime. One in five will experience sexual assault. Uh, an Australian woman is uh, hospitalised every three hours as a result of family violence. Three women are uh, hospitalised every week as a result of brain injury uh, from family violence. It's a factor in over 60% of child protection issues. And as Joey said, it's a, it's a key driver of homelessness and it's costing us. It costs the uh, Australian economy 21.7 billion, that's billion, every year. So when we look at um, the causes of violence against women, historically we've kind to tend to look at individual uh, and simplistic factors. Things like uh, the perpetrator's psychological state or uh, behaviours like drug and alcohol or experiences like past experience of violence. Um, or circumstances like unemployment. But what the research tells us, and research from the World Health Organization, from the World Bank, from the European Commission, from the UN, tells us consistently that a core 
uh, causal factor of violence against women is gender inequality. So when we think about gender inequality in Australia, we can think that actually we've achieved that. You know, we're there because women can vote, uh, they can um, uh, they can go to work after they've had a child. Remember the old days when as soon as women had a baby, they would have to give up work. Um, we would have to, uh, you know, um, women can divorce now or separate if they want. So certainly when we compare ourselves to other countries, we seem to be faring, faring very well. But just let's test that a little bit. As Joey said, the pen, gender pay gap is now 19% uh, the difference. And it's actually getting worse. In 2004, it was only 14%. So it's actually worsening. And here's a really clear example about why that matters, why a gender pay gap matters. When we um, changed the legislation in Victoria to allow women to remain in the home and have perpetrators removed for the very first time, we thought we'd be able to reduce the significant rates of homelessness experienced by women and all the things that come with that, like kids being taken from schools, um, disruption from their education, disconnection from their communities. But in fact, we've been not able to take as advantage of that as we hoped because of two reasons. One is it's really difficult for women to remain safely in their home because often that's when the violence really escalates. But the other reason is because it's very difficult for women to afford to live independently because they're paid at such lesser rates than men. So uh, Council to Homeless Persons did some research uh, last year that looked at suburbs in Australia that were affordable to women on a pension with young children and identified in Victoria there's only one suburb that she would be able to afford to live independently. Women's roles as carers, primary carers, has had a huge impact. Women are often more expected to take time out for work, to take care of the family, which disrupts their, um, their employment opportunities, and can also, uh, that's where they can also be discriminated against in relation to promotion. But also we know that um, pay differences start at a very early age. Recent research, just this week uh, that was uh, released, identified that this starts with kids pay um, pocket money. There's discrepancies in the rates at which we pay pocket money to girls and boys. Young graduates from university will immediately be paid less. Uh, female um, uh, candidates will be paid less in their first areas of work. We've got much fewer women in uh, positions of leadership, so in our court system, uh, as politicians. In fact, there's only 17% of CEOs across Australia uh, who are women. And why does that matter? I think sometimes when women's groups call for uh, gender equality, uh, equal numbers of women in courts, um, in courts, uh, gender, sorry, um, pay equality, things like that, people can assume that we're calling for it just for parity, for parity's sake. But we know that this is absolutely critical, that countries where we have gender equality, uh, there are much fewer rates of violence against women. So this is critical. When we look at the drivers of violence against women, there's three things. And this really shows what everyday people can do in uh, improving the status of women and also reducing rates of violence against women. So, Firstly, is the extent to which we as a community tolerate disrespectful attitudes towards women and make excuses for violence. So I think sometimes we understand the link between, say, racism and race-related violence or homophobia and homophobic-related violence. We really need to strengthen our understanding about the links between sexism and violence against women. And this is what good men and good women can do on a daily basis, is challenge uh, those attitudes. The other way is, um, and this is particularly at men, and we have men ask us all the time, what can we do, what can I do as a man to address violence against women? Well, we know that what influences men is what other men think. And when uh, there's disrespectful attitudes towards women expressed in, in you know, social areas, in our, in our social groups, um, when there's, uh, when violence supportive attitudes towards women are expressed and they go unchallenged. We know 
that this supports the conditions that allows violence against women to flourish. Men think the rest of the community agree that I can behave this way. So good men can challenge uh, those kind of um, attitudes towards, uh, towards women amongst some men. And the other thing is the rigid stereotypes between men and women. We know this has a huge impact. So challenging the notion that the only role for women in our community is um, as either carers or sex objects, we really need to be raising uh, young men and young women to be equal, to be respectful, uh, and to ensure that we're aiming for both young men and young women to have equal outcomes in their lives. So thank you so much for uh, allowing me to speak to you. Thank you for taking the time to listen about this really critical issue. And thanks again to the organisers for such a wonderful event. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. And just before you go, we've um, got a lovely gift for you. It's the keys to a new car. And also, um, we have uh, some lovely flowers for you. So thank you so much. Please thank Fiona again, everybody. Um, prior to coming up here, or getting asked actually to come up here, I did some research about International Women's Day and um, some of the, some of the uh, information on the internet was quite confronting, I would say, but then it made me think about the, the amazing women in my life and who has had the greatest influence. Obviously, um, it's mum, so she starts the pinnacle for me, but then um, I've had many, many other people that have, that have uh, created some great influence and have showed me that, um, not, as a male, it doesn't necessarily have to be another male that can be a mentor and a role model for me. We can look towards women, we can look towards you know, all genders, all, all uh, races, all religions, and, and certainly for me, um, one of the key uh, people in my life was my mother and how she sort of influenced my upbringing. So although she didn't become the CEO of a great company such as Fiona, she did have an influence on myself and well, without her I wouldn't be here today, so, um, but uh, thank you. But there's a couple of others, and that's my sister, my beautiful partner over there, and my daughter. So they were sort of the four in the, in the, uh, in the role, so thank you. Um, now, I'd like to introduce our next act, and our first of the creative uh, poets. He's the founder and director of Creative Rebellion Youth, spoken word poet, hip-hop fanatic, MC, and author whose craft developed from a realisation of freedom of speech. Sudanese born, he was illiterate when he and his family arrived in Australia in 2004 as the UN High Commission uh, designated refugees. Since realising his illiteracy, he began reading and writing to improve his ly ly lyrical content for hip hop music. When it became apparent to him, the best thing you can do for yourself is to feed your mind. He went on to become the third, become third in the Australian National Poetry Slam and self-published Humble, his first collection in 2013. Please make welcome Abe Nuke. Wow. Um, I was blushing when he was talking about me just then. <laughs> like, do I know that guy? Yeah. Good afternoon. Happy International Women's Day. I was talking to um, Melissa Blair, uh, the acting senior sergeant. Yes. You let them boys know you are in charge. <laughs> yeah? Let them boys know. Uh, with, with all due humility, it takes, it takes a lot. Um, I grew up in a household of eight children, yes. My mother had to deal with all of us. Uh, can you imagine the morning traffic in that household? Uh, but of course, I wouldn't be standing here if it wasn't for her, her decisions and her, her bravery. And I think it's, it's, something, um, it's something the world has not yet taken into account, that women make decisions that either make a family or break a family. I'm lucky to have been at the end of one where my mom insisted, even though she had no formal education, to make decisions that have brought me here. Uh, I'm, not taking, I'm not taking away from all of her credit, but it's an amazing thing. Uh, so thank you to, to, to everyone who's put this event together to recognize women. Um, <laughs> I'm going to share with you a poem, uh, but I just want, I want you to find your way through it. Um, here's, here's an interesting fact about me, just to get it out of the way. I used to be short. That's a true story. That's a true story. Uh, so here's, here's one, and I hope, I, hope, I hope you find your way through it. I grew up in a family of eight children. 
My goodness, the morning traffic. The best part about it, whenever something broke at home, I was innocent till proven guilty. There are seven more suspects. But I'm the middle child, so can you imagine the morning traffic? I was the one who was always blamed by the jury of his peers. But you see, in 1999, my mother made a decision. In 2000, she executed. At around 3 a.m. one morning, we found ourselves packing suitcases that did not contain much, and we were jammed into a van. I wanted to stuff my childhood belongings and all of my friends into mine. Impossible, I know. I tried. Some things, regardless of how far back we stretch our arms to reach, will always get left behind. I learned children learn to let go. We found ourselves in Cairo, a pretty decent temporary place considering we were refugees. Cairo was hot. Cairo was so hot, I got a permanent tan. I did. Nothing could have prepared us for the odds. Sometimes it isn't the challenges faced, it's whether you choose to follow through. My mother leaped, and she always talks about, if you're not aiming for the stars, don't bother looking up. She says, those with parachutes hesitate to fly, and those without take a leap of faith. We, at the extensiveness of her diligence, at the Australian Embassy in Cairo, my mom sought asylum on our behalf. An Australian citizen valued my mother's efforts. It's the only reason I'm granted this platform and a home where my siblings and I could break things and we would never have to break up for survival. At the landing of a pen stroke, someone sealed my family's fate. It's only fitting to take this moment and say, thank you, Australia. You used to be kind, and I know you still can to those who need it most. Thank you. I talk about my mom a lot. Um, me and the guys before were at home, and, and my mom just came out dressed in this African fabric. She was just showing off to these guys. I'm standing there like, Mom, you're embarrassing me. This is, this is not cool. This is not cool. But, of course, I grew up in a household of eight children, and my sister just gave birth recently to uh, my third niece. And um, I was at the post office uh, trying to get my passport, and the lady at the post office said, uh, can you get your real birth certificate? So I went back home and I asked my mom for my real birth certificate. So she gave me all these stacks of papers. And I was flipping through them, and it says my mother was born on the 1st of January. My sister was born on the 1st of January. My older brother was born on the 1st of January. I was born on the 1st of January. Now, my dad couldn't have been that precise. It's just, it's just. But here's the thing, while we were going through that transition, I, I had to come to terms with the very fact that my nieces are the reason why what we went through as refugees is something that we can now forgive because we've got this opportunity to live. So me and my mother went to, uh, went to calls to get a birthday cake for my, for my sister. And while we were walking, she was, she was telling me about how she thinks racism is an illusion. It's a, it's a form of self-pity that people use because they are too insensitive. And while we, while we were having this conversation on our way to Woolworth, a lady pushing a trolley, her... Her baby kid yelled out, Mommy, a black guy. And my mother looked at the child ever so lovingly and said, No, he's chocolate. <laughs> Have you ever tried correcting your mom in public? <laughs> it doesn't add up. But I think at that moment, I knew what it meant to start to acknowledge people's curiosity. Uh, and my, my mother is entirely the reason why I am the character that I am today. Uh, and my, Maya Angelou, one of my favorite poets, emphasized that you have to learn to pay attention when your elders are speaking. But then again, you have to learn to listen when women are speaking because theirs is wisdom. Men have knowledge. Sorry for all the men that I just uh, I don't agree with that, but uh, there it goes. I'm going to close out with this poem. I hope you find your way through it. My mom says... You have to start wearing shoes that have laces and make sure you tie them loosely so during the day when they come apart, you will take the time to kneel and tie your shoelaces. In that process, remember to be indulgent in gratitude. At first, I did not understand what she meant, but these days, it's starting to make sense. 
It's not so much so what we've been through, it's what we will get to make of this scenario. The stigma of having lived as a refugee is something people will struggle to understand, and that's understandable. Some people have asked me, have you been back home? The irony is, if I could be anywhere in the world, I would be home. The trouble is, home doesn't even know I exist. I used to think this was temporary, yet it's fast approaching permanent, and I never took it for granted, but unless you understand the hurdles, then you are far from understanding the predicament. The problem is the diligent task of trying to fit in. Learning a new language, one of the perks is you lose yours. I got so good speaking English, I lost my mother's native tongue. Will I ever be forgiven? Will I be able to learn it back? How am I supposed to do that? When I've never been home and I highly doubt I ever will. And by the looks of things, I highly doubt they ever want us back. But it's all good. I reminisce about the home that I will never have. Said it's all good when it ain't. I can't keep lying to myself. How is it good when I've never met grandma? Never got to trace her wrinkles, never got to walk within her shadow or be showered by the kisses grandchildren get. I've missed out on so much hearing what home is about. A part of me cries, a part of me dies. It ain't all good. I reminisce about the home that I will never have. When asked, have you been back home? In my heart I cry, but my face never shows it because I smilingly answer. If I could be anywhere in the world, I would be home. The trouble is, home doesn't even know I exist. So I remain a stranger knocking at somebody else's door. They peek, but at least they notice. Mom says, people are just people. You have to understand that we are the sinners in this world full of saints. And we have to imitate everyone who crosses our path. Thank you so very much for having me. Thank you, Abe. And uh, again, another set of car keys for you. Just before you go, take that or I'll take it. <laughs> and flowers, Abe. Don't forget your flowers. Oh, I know. Oh, I am blushing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is... Guys, come on. You didn't... Thank you, seriously. Uh, our next performer is a poet, dancer, singer-songwriter hailed from Singapore with Indian Malay heritage. She overcame the str struggles of being a newly arrived migrant and went on to becoming an award-winning poet and community arts worker, receiving Victoria's Multicultural Awards for Excellence for her work in the arts. In 2015, she was awarded the UNESCO City of Literature grant to receive mentorship in diversity education through poetry in New York City. She had featured twice in the prestigious Bowery Poetry Club in New York City and has performed at the United Nations Conference, Art Centre Melbourne and venues across Melbourne. Most recently her works were featured at International Writers Festival in Bali and she continues to run poetry and arts programs in schools and community organisations. She's also a singer-songwriter and has supported international hip-hop acts such as Lyrics Born and Dead Prez. She's the founder of Sisters for Sisters, a Melbourne-based music and arts collective aimed at creating a platform for female artists while addressing a myriad of social issues, both locally and internationally. Please give a great big welcome to Eid Brahim. Thank you so much. How's everyone going? Good. Happy International Women's Day to all the beautiful women and to the men as well. So, I was wondering what poem I'm going to start today with and my journey through India has been a really important moment in my life where I really got to experience how women in developing countries really live and I was so humbled by the experience and so I'm going to share this poem called The Wand. A woman cries tears for a broken world. She cries and then again and again she rises even when they tell her to be quiet to be seen and never heard. Women with backs always strong despite the struggles. Women with soft hearts and erect spines. Women that know wisdom and knowledge goes far beyond qualifications. Women that are seen and told never heard. Women that are said that they have to be trapped in the mind-made ghetto, that they have nowhere to go so that they can live in fear to the final hour. Women with bright saris and onyx eyes, cries of pleas from barren fields to crowded streets, the rich encroach and the poor retreat deeper into the slums of the displaced, disgraced,
the purposefully erased, the ones driven off ancestral lands, the ones unaccounted for, like farmers with no lands to farm. So darkened lives move to the bright lights of the city, then find themselves sleeping on pavements, scavenging for food and the half-smoked biddy, the ones unaccounted for, like red ribbons in jet black hair, soaked in coconut oil, shiny in the sun as she toils and toils, the jingle jangle of her Bengali bangles, street cables in tangles, the carrot continually dangles, watching on TV what the haves have, and the have-nots, they crave and they never have. My beautiful sister, where are you in all of this? You're a pawn in the social disease. You can be seen and never heard. You're like a faint echo from an unsung battered lip. You're the first to awake and the last to sleep. This pain in your heart as you silently weep the cry of the ones. The ones toiling the land with her child on her back. She's toiling the land with her two bare feet and at night, with the last ounces of her energy, she serves her husband's needs after all of that. Or a child of 14, she's sold by her kin, her young flesh pimped on red streets to vulgar vultures hungry for sweet virgin meat. But sis, I see your eyes and I feel your thirst and I know you ask, why do men come first? And who made these riverbanks first? But I'll carry your tales with this pen in my purse to write down the stories of your courage, your strength, your sweat, and your tears. And you say to me, to live in drudgery is a rural woman's legacy. So you accept the unacceptable. You grace disgrace with your amazing grace. I ask myself, could I last even a day without your reality, and I don't know if I ever could, so I'll just, I'll just salute you. I salute your strength. I salute your resistance. I salute your resilience. I salute erect spines made strong with love and purpose with soft hearts. I salute you. I salute you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have to make a dedication to my mom on this very important day. My mom worked in a factory for 15 years of her life, of her life, standing on her feet, just to make sure that I get to go to school and speak English and have this amazing life that I now have. So this is a poem that I wrote for my mom. The sole of my mama's feet is where heaven and earth meet. Mother to mother, in this ancient proverb, I take heed. Working her fingers to the bones in the graveyard shift from 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. Human machines in assembly lines. She tried to fit in the city and live the life that I never had. My mom making pittance for remittance, sending money back home. Her beautiful struggle for the sake of family survival. There's really nothing this woman can't handle. She even burns herself to give light, just like a candle. And with all the stories she told, and as her stories unfold, I learned to find my strength through her struggles. She told me, keep the right attitude, turn within, it's all within me. So I speak this poem for you to show gratitude for my mom today on International Women's Day. Thank you. I have one more poem, is that okay? All right, this is um, a very new poem. No one's heard it, so you're, you're getting it first here in the Donenong market. This one's called My Body. It stopped feeling right. I know you heard it in my bones and locking hips. I know you did, but you took it anyway. My body is not your dumping ground not your place of release, 
not your trophy, not your jumping off point for a new slate, not the landing strip for pornographic reenactments of white cum on brown belly fetish. My body is not for your distractions or for your brown sugar cravings. My body is a sacred site, yes, but not for the tourist bucket list. Tick. Yeah, I've been there. It is not the free soup sample at the supermarket. My body is too vast for shallow slurps. It is the herb garden that grew cardamom and cinnamon and turmeric and sage and ginger that gives and heals like homeopathic drops and tinctures. My body is not your gymnasium, not weights for you to test or bulk your power with and my solar plexus is not the punching bag for your unresolved emotions the next time you come for temporary cuddles to kill time until the next time know that my body is not your mama's not a well for you to milk dry all that you've missed out on in childhood but come with reverence in all of your essence and your presence and my body will give you more than you ever know my body is not your science lab. No, I don't give you permission to lay your curious on me, to test your fantasies, your strategies for some contest. My body is not the satellite tower for you to broadcast your stolen conquest. My body is mine. It's mine. It's mine to objectify like celestial objects, like asteroids and stars shining on stale carpets and fresh scars. My body is mine. It's my contradiction. It's my secret to tell or not to tell. It's my right to cover up or to rebel it's my made-up word to idolize and misspell what you told me was my hell was in fact my well of everlasting power so cast your pious eyes your dirty looks your greedy hooks away from my body there is nothing wrong in walking strong and proud and vulnerable and flawed there is nothing wrong with making you pay attention to the swaying of my gullies and my oceans I've always been here doing my thing there is nothing wrong with my body my body is crowning heads through birth canals my body is humble creeks and waterfalls my body is an open palm always facing the source always drawing in more love to give even through it all my body is the echo of your grand your great great grandchildren's laughter my body mends and heals it braces and builds from billions of light years ago a beautiful tapestry of interference patterns stitched with stardust and synovial fluids for God's movement. My body is God's movement and library of information. Just read the signs. It's all there in my body. Thank you very much. That was absolutely incredible. Ida, can I please pass on this as a gratitude of thanks for what you just did, that was amazing. And um, we have some flowers for you as well. Please, another round of applause for Ida, that was amazing. Um, and while the official part of the day is now over, um, there is a few thanks that need to go out, of course, and that is uh, uh, to the organisers. Nush, I know you didn't want to be mentioned, and Linda, wherever you are, I know you didn't want to be mentioned either, but where is she? She's actually ran away, so she didn't... Oh, they're hiding right, okay. But uh, you two did an amazing job organising today, so please, ladies and gentlemen, um, give Nush and Linda a great big round of applause. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for spending the time to come out here today and acknowledging how important today is. Uh, it is a, an amazing day for all, and it's certainly um, a stepping stone. I don't think we've achieved it, but a stepping stone to something we want to achieve. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues from YSAS here. Hello. Uh, obviously paying attention by techno. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, again, thank you all. And there's one thing I'd like to do before we all finish up and network and eat and make friends um, is I would like you all to make the most noise you possibly can in whatever possible way you can for that to resonate across Dandenong and show our support for Women's International Day or International Women's Day. So please, everybody, big round of applause, whatever you can do.
Well done, and thank you to everyone again for attending. Thanks. Bye-bye.